The Cellcast is recorded in front of a live streaming audience. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Cellcast. Joining me today is a man who just wants to ride his bee. Welcome, Jacob. Because I'm buzzing with excitement. Yeah, kind this, of. Yeah, the thing is, this movie had a dog in it, but I couldn't think of a good pun to go along oh, with Oh, man. Hero didn't do much. Yeah, that is true. He didn't do much. Why, thank you. Love you, sir, because a man who's just hopping mad. Welcome, Drew. Hopping mad? There were Frog. no rabbits in this film. Frogs. <laughs> Okay, yes. Spanish, I can't do Spanish accent. <laughs> yes, Spanish frogs. Yes, yeah, Spanish frogs who, who, who wants his girl back. Which yes. isn't his girl in the first place. His niña. His niña. His niña. <laughs> Thank you, Charo. <laughs> anyway. Oh my gosh. Uh, we, I need to ask the trivia question. I need to do that first this yes, time. Do. I should be doing that first every time, but you know, sometimes I forget. You know what I did forget? Oh no! What did you forget? Bring it up. I did post it. Yes, you did. But of course, the music is still going because it's just going to go till it finishes. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'll cut it out. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it'll cut out like that thing. But I've already since I'm having to look this up. <laughs> Wonderful oh. thought we're having. I see. She probably saw the uh, um, the thing that said that the episode that we would normally release Saturday was going up Monday. That's probably what it was. Oh, okay. I got to you. To answer that question from before the show. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> trivia for this week's episode. Thumbelina is the first animated film to win a Razzie Award. In what category did it earn it? Oh, easy. Songs. <laughs> Yes, it was the songs. Specifically, which song? Oh, uh, the the one the one that earwormed in my head, and I wanted to bash it out with a with a with a mallet. And that is uh Giacomo song. No, it wasn't Giacomo. Song. It wasn't Giacomo song. It what wasn't was it? Giacomo song. What, which which other of these near songs was it? <laughs> well, it wasn't the you know the lovey dovey song. It wasn't. Uh, any of the it wasn't the frogs villain song. Okay. It wasn't the Beetle Ball. Oh gosh. Which honestly that should have been it. <laughs> For well, let's just say uh even someone pretending to be Gilbert Gottfried singing should not be allowed on this earth. Uh, oh jeez. <laughs> no, it was for Mary the Mole. Oh gosh, that <laughs> Yes, that. <laughs> That was the worst just, song then, to pick, right, people? <laughs> I'm going to be honest. For me, I actually liked Mary the Mole better than some other songs. Ag agreed. Yeah. But uh, Josh Adams was the one who got the complete right answer with mm -hmm. worst original song for Mary the Mole. To which uh, Stephanie Russell says, Aw, but I love that song. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Good for you, Stephanie. It was a, I'm not saying it was bad. I actually no. enjoyed it in comparison to some of the others. But if you consider the entirety of Barry Manilow's uh, catalog of music, that's not at the top. Because, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the score here was composed by Barry Manilow. Really? Yeah. Wow. He, he, I did not realize that. Award or, for this. Wow. No wonder he's not done a movie since. It's who would have thought? I mean, he did. This wasn't exactly his best work, right? But still, wow. I mean, this doesn't even hold a, ca a candle to the Folgers coffee jingle. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Anyway, anyways, uh, how are you doing, man? I'm doing very well. Uh, the weekend was fantastic. Uh, had a great Saturday. Sunday was great. Um. Monday was excellent. Today was good. Uh, minus I had to check for the last two days, but you know that's things you got to do, right? Um, for so, for uh, someone who uh, <coughs> stressed out as checking usually makes you, 
you seem to be in a good mood. Yeah, I think it's just more about like just having that 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 peace about things. Is like, hey, don't worry about it. Just do just, right. Just you know, it's take once, uh, uh, just take it one step at a time. For some reason, now I got the song stuck the Johnny from Johnny Cash song. Well, I, I've got another song stuck in my head from uh, Frozen Two. <laughs> it's the song that honest our honest sings when uh, like everything goes to poop. Everything went to poop in Frozen Two. Well, oh, yeah, everything went to poop in Frozen Two. I do remember that. <laughs> I don't remember her singing about it. <laughs> Mostly, what I remember from Frozen Two is into the unknown. <laughs> A bad version of that but either way it's just it's taking it's it's either way you should let it go yeah that's okay, sure i'm done with my joke <laughs> <laughs> but either way like yeah i've had a pretty good pretty good week uh i'm looking forward to um uh, just like you know things to come I'm, yes. I'll, that's all I'm going to say is things to come. Uh, other than that, I've been doing very well. Uh, I did go see a movie, and I'm going to mention that in my what I've watched yes. later. Yes. But how are you been doing, Drew? I had a good week. I uh, visited my parents over the weekend. So, and that's partially why uh, the this last episode went up a little late. Yeah, but because uh, I couldn't get it edited in time before mm. I went and. Uh, you didn't get the art done till Monday. Not that that would have been an issue. But, right. Uh, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. Although you still have the Patreon version I, of that to do I, still, don't I you? I do. I do. And I'm, I plan on doing that over the weekend. Okay. Before we can get that out there. And I, I hope you guys enjoy it. But yeah, we had a good weekend. I had a good weekend. Uh, I too saw a movie this weekend. Mm-hmm. I suspect we saw the same movie. Yes. But um, yeah, it was a good weekend. Had a good visit. Uh. Not much else to say. Yeah. So what did you think about the Batman? Oh my Just to go ahead. Gosh. It. So good. Five stars, ten stars, whatever. Like just incredible film. Oh my gosh. It's the fact that uh Matt Reeves just be like poured his soul, poured everything into this film. It's not one of these uh uh Munch your popcorn kind of movie. It, it makes you really have to think about everything that's going on. It's got twists and turns, like incredible story development, mm-hmm. character, um, uh, backgrounds, everything. Like the the mood, the lighting, everything. This is an artistic gold. And the fact to be like Batman, B- Batman Bruce Wayne, played by uh, Robert Pattinson, does a fantastic job with this with his role, along with everybody else in this film. Mm-hmm. And the fact that the Batman makes mistakes. <laughs> yeah. It'd be like, he, he's, he's human, he's flawed, and he makes mistakes. And some of those mistakes cost dearly. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Cause it was just, it was so, it was, cause you would hear the, uh, the, the main villain, the riddle Riddler say something and they would go off and they do this and they interrogate this person and be like, what am I the only one who understands Spanish? <laughs> Where, uh, okay. I love that scene. It's like, oh my gosh, they made a mistake. <laughs> and that's and the thing was, I knew the mistake the minute he made it. Yeah. Cause I'm sitting there going. Rat with wings. That sounds like a bat. That sounds like a bat. Going, it's a stool pigeon. It's like a, no, it's not. not. <laughs> it's a bat. You're a bat. It's a rat with wings. wings. <laughs> yes, I know traditionally a pigeon is considered a rat with wings, but you are literally a rat with wings. <laughs> literally. literally. Like, oh, it's got to be the penguin. <laughs> In- interesting how this how the Batman had the same four villains as Batman the movie from 1966. <laughs> And I'm, no others. They had. Well, technically, it wasn't the Joker. Mm-hmm. That's a spoiler. But anyway, yeah. But the Redler, of course, and then Catwoman, of course, mm-hmm. is in it. And I didn't realize the Penguin was going to be in this until it's like, oh, we're going to the Iceberg Lounge. Isn't that where the Penguin works? Yeah, we're going to go talk to a guy called the Penguin. Or Oz. <laughs> or, well, they called him the Penguin first before they called him Oz. That's true. I go on. He's in this film? Yeah. I had no idea this was coming. Like really? I hadn't, I hadn't watched a trailer since, like, the first trailer. Yeah. You know who played the Penguin, right? I didn't catch who it was. <laughs> Will Ferrell. I mean, Colin Farrell. Colin Farrell? That makes Colin sense. Colin Farrell. Will Ferrell, that would have been a surprise. <laughs> 
yeah, Colin Farrell with all the prosthetics and the makeup. And it's like, that's Colin, that's Colin Farrell. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Cause the, the, the couple sitting next to me is like, wait, who is that? Oh, it's Colin Farrell. It's like, who? <laughs> And apparently they they had been like all the Batman movies beforehand. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, there's no connection whatsoever. Ab- absolutely none. It is its own thing. Yeah. Except that it reminded me a lot of Batman the Animated Series. It did. <laughs> which I appreciated because honestly, that's what I wa- have been wanting. Yes, a lot of people since, have said that. Uh, well, s- since the Batman and Robin. That is what I have wanted since Batman and Rob since I saw Batman and Robin originally. It's like what you need is Batman the animated series, but live action and on the big screen. You can do this. And Nolan didn't do that. He went to this super ultra realistic. Zack Snyder didn't do that for reasons I don't understand. <laughs> but whatever. But this is like You did it. And he's actually just driving a car. You didn't give him a tank. You gave him a really cool jet-powered car. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh man, it's amazing that that scene where they where the Batmobile shows up because you don't even, you only see the Batmobile in the background underneath a tarp. Yeah, like one scene before this, and they're doing all this fighting, and eventually you realize, hey, Batman's missing. Where'd he go? And all of a sudden, the music cuts out, and you hear this high-pitched whine, and immediately I was like. The Batmobile! He's in the Batmobile! <laughs> because that's obviously the propane torch going off. That's gonna be that's gonna like the jet engine that he's gonna run over these guys with. This was my, my inner eight-year-old was in love with this movie. I can ima- yeah, I can imagine. Oh my gosh. So just generally curious, like how would you rate the film? How would you rate it from general? Four point five stars just because uh I still don't like the Riddler's mask in this. It creeped me out a little too much. Oh, I love that. It was so good. <laughs> it, it, I, I like the concept of the Riddler. I would have been happy if they'd just gone with the domino mask. I understand the reasoning why they went with the mm. full mask because they want to hide they, throughout the movie, they want to hide who the Riddler is. Unfortunately, I don't think they ever hinted, they ever showed the Riddler unmasked anywhere prior to his actual reveal. In the movie. No. By so the way, that spoiler, doesn't work. Yeah, by the way, spoilers for the Batman. Just saying. That really didn't spoil anything. No. Oh, they catch the Riddler. Of course yeah. they did. It's a Batman a movie. movie. And it, it's, unless, except the Batman makes another mistake. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, anyway. Yeah, I would definitely give it a five. I love this film. It was so good. I know I've known people who were reviewers and non-reviewers be like, I'm going to go watch this again. And um, someone I know who does not like superhero films be like, it's like, eh, it's not for me. And uh, I was like, okay. And it's like, this was an amazing film. I don't care if you're a non comic book fan, non geek fan, whatever. Uh, this is a film to watch because it is a tour of force art masterpiece of a film. Highly worth watching for anybody. Okay. Mine is just three hours. Now that we've, gushed about that movie what else did you watch <laughs> okay so besides watching the batman uh i watched obviously i watched this movie and to be frank i needed a palate cleanser <laughs> i can imagine for watching this film so i after watching it is a little sugary it is a little sugary agreed so i need a little palate washer palate palate cleanse so i i don't i I was already on Disney Plus watching this, so it's was like, eh, just watch something else. And so I wound up watching and slightly embarrassed watching this, but hey, it's a movie. Uh, I actually watched uh, Secret of the Wings, if you know what that is. It's on Disney. So you went from sugar to nectar. Uh, fairy dust, actually. Nectar. <laughs> yeah, fairy dust. <laughs> You still were in a fairy mood. Apparently, yeah, I was. Uh, it was it was in the queue after watching Thumbelina. I was like, eh, why not? I think I've seen it before, and I was like, oh, okay, that's an interesting film. It's got some good concepts, and but there again, it's designed for little kids, 
And it's just more like, oh, okay, I can see where like the like the bigger picture they're trying to build here. Mm-hmm. It was it was really good. It'd be like there's parts of it that were really, really good, and then it's more like, oh, okay, yeah, this is definitely for li- like little kids. But overall, I thought it was very a very nice little film. And uh, and then I started watching while I was doing notes this afternoon. I started watching. If I can get back to the top of my notes, deal it. Not you get it, hit it. Is it going? Nope. Well, I know how to fix this. Come on. Come on. You're almost there. You got to love technology, there. people, right? Got to love it. It says it's going live. <laughs> I see it circling. Round. Encircling. Okay. Encircling. Yeah. There we go. All right. Mark, go ahead. All right. All that, all that to cover like a three second thing that I should have let go. <laughs> but I started watching uh, Cold Case Balls on Hulu. Uh-huh. And I am a huge true crime nut. I think at some point I need to wear a shirt that a friend, that a, uh, someone I care about uh, made me. And, um, uh, had maybe, and this was more, it's a true crime. It's about a cr- criminals trying to get away with stuff. And they ultimately get caught and, uh, watched like three, two, three episodes. The first one just hit me like a ton of bricks and just made me think it's like some, how some people are not, I don't want to say they're, they're not a good parent, but their actions led to the death of their own child. And they, the fact that, you know, they allowed their child to do this and they didn't go pick up their child when they were supposed to, when they were already out. So you had flashbacks to a, a certain movie we saw in our first year about Ooh. fireflies. Oh, uh, yeah, kind of okay. in, in, in a way, in a way, the 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 misresponsibility of a mm-hmm. parent was just kind of drove drove that home and. It's like, yeah, this was a bad case, and it's like cold case goods. It's you go back to like uh, listening to our the the Bible study we're doing right now with uh, cold case Christianity. Yeah, like you're going back and reexamining a case that's like five, ten years old, and uh, it's just like it's heartbreaking watching this. And it's just they finally caught him, and it's just like, what the heck? But I was a parent. If my co- my child got murdered. Be like, yeah, let me, let me, leave me alone with this person for five minutes and give me a bat. <laughs> I don't care if I go to jail. <laughs> I'm just going to say that in the Bible, it says vengeance is the Lord's. Oh, I, oh, yours. oh, I agree. I agree. But it's just that, that part of me be like, oh my gosh, you heard Perhaps a kid. it's wise that we don't give you a bat and leave you alone. For <laughs> what I'm saying. Agreed. Oh, great. Yeah, I got you. Totally get it totally get it but uh it's it's definitely worth a watch if you are a uh, true crime fan like i am and many others uh it's worth it it's heartbreaking but at the same time it's just like you get down to like the nitty-gritty of how they uh discern how a crime happened and how they solve them eventually so yeah that is what i have been watching drew okay uh other than of course this movie yeah I saw a couple episodes of Wagon Train while visiting my parents. An yeah. episode of uh, uh, Rawhide, which is not just a great theme song, but is an actual TV show starring Clint Eastwood in one of his earliest appearances. He really? didn't know that. He's a major character in that show. Really? Yeah. Bef- before the Spaghetti Western era age, oh. I believe. Hmm. Anyway, um, I watched another movie for our appearance on uh, Retro Rewind at the end of this week. Right. Called uh, the Thief and the Cobbler. Thief and the the Cobbler. cobbler. My brain just like, it's like the Cobbler. The problem is the movie has, there's like four different cuts of this movie. And they all have different names. Really? Well, there's the Thief and the Cobbler, which is what's on the thing. But that's Mm -hmm. actually the original work cut, the original cut that never got finished. Then there's the Princess and the Cobbler, which has... Uh, it's kind of cleaned up and put in a presentable format. Yeah. And then there's Arabian Night, which is actually the movie that's on that disc. 
that they've renowned, since renamed Thief and the Cobbler. Yeah. Starring Matthew Broderick. Really? Yeah. As the as uh, the Cobbler. Hmm. Uh, in all the versions, you've actually got a... Uh, oh, Piddle. Radigan. Uh, Vincent Price. Vincent Price. Yeah, Vincent Price playing the wizard Zigzag. Because uh, they recorded it like back when he was still alive. Yeah. Uh, Obviously. And, and they used... His that performance is like that's one of the biggest names in the movie besides Matthew Broderick. Yeah, we're gonna from the from the original. That's the, that's the biggest name in the movies. Uh, we'll, we'll use that and work it around that. Uh, and then there is the fan edit recobbled cut that is supposed to bring it use like the footage from all three of those things and get it as close to the original vision. Because spoiler alert. Uh, that film has got a sad story attached to its production because mm. it started production in 1964, came out in like the 90s. Whoa! And it was rushed to completion. This was some guy's magnum opus. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richard Williams, that's the guy's name. Mm. And it was just going to be his magnum opus, and he got fired from the production uh, at the very end so they could get it done. Oh, jeez! And released. Wow. And yeah. There's been, they made some changes to make it more presentable because it's very much, you can tell, focused on one person's vision. And I'm not going to spoil anything for the Retro Rewind episode. Okay. But show up for that. I have some opinions. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I watched both uh, the the uh, the Miramax version and the recobbled cut between the last two days. That was interesting. That's all I'm going to say is it's interesting. Mm. Um other than that, I really have not had time to do much else while mm. visiting my parents and all. So, uh, yeah. Okay. That's what I've been watching. All right. What do we got in the news? All right. Not so much, obviously. Outside of the announcement that uh, you got your wish. In what way? Remember when we, on our uh, anniversary episode, and we I brought up the trailer for the Super Pets movie? Yes. And you said you needed wanted Ace the Bat Hound. Really? You haven't seen the trailer yet. Not which one? The newest one? The newest one that features Batman and Ace the Bat Hound. Oh, okay. And that's I'm that's it. Must have been with on the trailer. I assumed it was on the trailer for uh, the Batman. Yeah, but I it wasn't on mine because we didn't have any trailers before my show where I watched it. Yeah, I assumed it would have been attached to yours since I know you saw it in a normal theater. Right, be like, no, I, 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 I saw that trailer and it didn't dawn on me. Like, oh, that's Ace. I didn't think about that. <laughs> yeah. Why else would Batman be talking to a dog? That is true. That is so true. That was funny though. That yes. was very funny. Uh, so yeah, uh, that super better be a licensed product or I'm going to freak. freak. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that movie's coming. Squishy Bruce. <laughs> Squishy Bruce. <laughs> so yes, that that movie, uh, Super Pets. Am I right? Yes, uh, League of Super Pets. I League think. of Super Pets is coming out, I think, in that the next is, couple of months. Yeah, and I have a feeling we're going to react to it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That looks like unadulterated fun. It does. It does. Which is all I really want. All right, so speaking of movies that are coming out very shortly, uh, Turning Red, which is being exclusive on Disney+. Plus. Uh, there is a one night only in certain theaters. None of them around us, unfortunately. Uh, or but, it will actually be in theaters. Yeah, I, I did see... Uh, I don't think it's around us anyway. Yeah, when I was when I was watching uh, the Batman in our, my local theater... Sorry. No, no, you're good. Uh, it always helps when... Like Drew has the screen up, so I'm <laughs> I'm watching the camera and trying to watch myself, and, and then all of a sudden, sudden just Google, blap, Google. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, tr- yeah, like I saw the the uh, trailer, the trailer, the poster in the theater, and I was like, maybe, but either or. Um, so uh, turning red is uh, coming to Disney Plus this Friday. And apparently there's already been some reviews of the film. And let me pull this up really fast. I have double checked. It is nowhere near us. Okay. All right. So in news, 
Uh, Turning Red is winning over critics with its heartwarming message, beautiful animation, and humorous take on being a girl being thrown into a supernatural, uh, awkward, an awkward phase. The newest, uh, the newest Pixar feature, which premieres as a Disney Plus exclusive March 11th, boasts, uh, boosts a 94% review review score on Rotten Tomatoes and 85 on Metacritic. So it looks like it's doing pretty good. Uh, there again, these are early screenings of the film, so we don't know what the general audience knows about this film yet. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, I'm not, sh- uh, I'm not sure if we're, I know be like, we I will, I would like, to, we have, we have not, we have planned, not planned a reaction. Episode, we have, but yeah. I, honestly, considering we have reacted to the last three as in, the last Pixar movies that have come out since we started the podcast. That is true. I kind of think we can't miss it. That is true. We have to keep the, keep it, uh, the street going. So yeah. I don't know when we're going to do it though. Yeah. So we'll, we will let you know at a, uh, in a future date when we will re- review or react to, uh, turning red. Yes. In a future. maybe not this Friday. We have plans. And there, there are plans that are in, in, well, she came over a little early. I but then we could. wouldn't have time to watch it. Never mind. Yeah, that's true. We'll plan else l- later. Yeah, we'll plan later. But again, we will let you know when we're going to uh, do a reaction to... Or it'll to... just show up on the feed. Exactly. Either or. So yeah, that is all the bit of news that I know of, unless someone else knows information that I don't know. <laughs> The Batman uh, bat dog thing was the only thing I knew. Yeah, that's true. That was funny when I, when I realized. Oh, that's Ace. Oh yes. my gosh, it, it's it's you not Ace from Batman wish. Beyond, huh? You got your wish. Yeah, thank you. Rough. Let's just get Streaky the Super Cat in there, and we'll have a grand old time. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's all we have for in news. All right. Well, then we need to get into the spoiler-free section mm-hmm. of our review of Thumbelina. Mm-hmm. This was my first viewing mm-hmm. of Thumbelina because when it came out in 1994, I was an eight to nine year old boy, and Power Rangers was on television. Uh, of course. Give you an idea of my tastes at the time. Mm. This would not have Thumbelina would not have been it. Uh. <laughs> and since I didn't see it when I was of eight, I was a kid. And it kind of started becoming a little harder to find it, you know, after I was no longer a kid. I just never watched it until now. Okay. It's just not not something that was on my radar, I'll put to be honest. Uh, but for what I saw, it was a very it done very well. It was a good movie. Yeah. Um I got really close about halfway through the movie. For for the first half of the movie, I was really Leaning towards my thoughts on Anastasia. Oh, jeez. <laughs> but then I realized I was looking at the movie wrong. Mm. And then I was like, okay, I now follow this. I I, I understand what, what, what we're doing. I actually understood what the thing was. Because I kept, I was waiting, just, just to give a spoiler alert, there is no one big bad villain. No, there's in this not. this movie. There are a number of characters that get close, but none of them are like, you know, we got, we have no one on the, on the, of, uh, we don't have the Duke from uh, the last, the movie immediately previous to this. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing. This movie came out right after Rockadoodle. Oh, like, that makes sense. Yeah. You can kind of see some of the crossover in yeah. the art style. But we don't have a, an enemy like the Duke in this. We don't have your Gastons, your Ursulas, your Scars, mm. other big villains from this time period. No, we've got three people who are just greedy mm-hmm. in one form or another, trying to stop Thumbelina from getting married to the Fairy Prince. <laughs> I have no idea how close this movie is to the uh, source material. Mm. But... uh what little I did read made it sound like in the original Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, the prince didn't show up until the very end. Mm. So I will say, I do like the fact that they bring him in a little earlier than that, but, um, yeah, I thought this was a very good movie. 
I do think it's more geared towards girls than uh, boys. But boys will like it, I think, if they're forced to watch it. If that makes <laughs> sense. Right. Um, but yeah, that's my thoughts. Okay. Also, I wish Gilbert Gottfried was not in this movie, but more on that later. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, there. This is my first time as well watching the film. Uh, there again, I was trying not to have any expectations going into the film, knowing that this you know was another Don Bluth film. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. there's got to be something behind it because Don Bluth is a uh, visual artist and he's very good at what he does. And uh, I hope he does more projects later on the line. Later on line, but back to this movie. If he ever gets done with Dragon Slayer, <laughs> if he ever does. Um, so going into it, uh, I enjoyed certain aspects of this film. Uh, there's a character or two that drove me absolutely nuts. Uh, more on that later. More on that later. Um. Oh my gosh. There there was I'm watching the film and it's like okay, it's Chuck Long. You'll be like you're you're the story's very well told. Mm-hmm. Uh and certain things keep getting repeated over and over and over again. And by by the end of it, be like, I am just literally at my wits end. I'm like, really? <laughs> be like, even the even the uh the uh the uh, the closing credits has the same stinking song at the end. It's like, oh my gosh! Like there again, I need a cu- palate cleanser at the end of this film. Let's say that. What on earth? Why did you choose that one? I'll never know. <laughs> I don't know. It was the it was the next thing in queue, except for uh, I think uh, the movie that started the entire thing, which was uh, Peter Pan. Maybe I should have went with Peter Pan. Peter Pan might have been a good choice. Maybe. In your case, though, for real palate cleanser, I'd have gone with The Mandalorian, because you do need to finish that. I, I do. I do need to finish that. But yes, it's my non-spoiler review of Thumbelina. Mm. All right. Well, join us on the other side of the bumpers, and we will get to spoiling this thing. Don't forget that you can download. Download? Don't forget that you can't. Uh, you know. Don't forget that you can listen to us record the podcast live every Tuesday over on our Facebook page, The Cellcast, our uh, Twitch channel, The Cellcast Gaming, and on YouTube at Cellcast. Also, don't forget to join our Patreon if you would like to support us monetarily. At $1, you'll get our everlasting thanks. At at our $5 tier, you can get some artwork from Jacob. And at our $10 tier, you can get bloopers for every every episode we've released that I've remembered to release them for. And you can get commentaries from different movies. So come check us out over there if you would like to support us financially. Each week on Stunning and Brave, hosts Chris Cowan of the Babylon Bee and Nate Henderson of Some Boring Budgeting Job confess their privilege, spotlight stunning social media posts, and fabricate outrage, all while keeping you super woke and enlightened. They will make you laugh. That's right, you have no choice. Check out Stunning and Brave at stunningandbrave.net. Do you like Star Wars? I don't just mean the original trilogy. Along with that, I mean the prequels, the sequels, the anthologies, the animated shows, and of course, (laughs) who doesn't like Baby Yoda? Well, if you've been in the fandom for any length of time, you know how toxic the fandom can get. And if you'd like to be able to discuss a galaxy far, far away in a much more positive light, might I suggest searching out The Outer Rim, a Facebook group dedicated to all Star Wars, and check out their YouTube channel, which you can easily find at Pop Americana, which the podcast you're currently listening to is also a part of. To find that and more, check out the link in the description. following is a spoiler-filled review for the movie Thumbelina. Listener discretion is advised. Thumbelina was written and directed by Don Bluth, and it was also directed by Gary Goldman. And it's based on the fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen. 
And as I said earlier, the music was all composed by Barry Manilow. And boy, was this not his best work. What is so funny? I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'll get into my dislikes. Okay. Getting into the actual, getting into the cast on this. Gina Conforti was the voice of Giacomo. And apparently he played the Man of La Mancha. In the Man of La Mancha, he played the barber. Yeah. From like, a, it's it, the old version of the Don Quixote movie. Oh, okay. Uh, Barbara Cook was the voice of Mother. And uh, sh- she was uh, Jane Piper in Babes in Toyland. Okay. There's a movie you haven't seen, I bet. I've never heard of it. It's on Disney+. Plus. Really? Yes. Huh. One of those kind of movies. I gotcha. Uh, Jody Benson was the voice of Thumbelina. Of course, she was Ariel in The Little Mermaid. In every iteration of Ariel? E- every iteration. All the way up to Ralph Breaks the Internet, I believe, was the last thing she did. Yeah. Uh, Will Ryan was the voice of... Hero and Reverend Rat, and he played Petrie in The Land Before Time. Oh, okay. That's where we're going to get his name from. Yes. Uh, June Foray was the voice of Queen Tabitha, and she was Mrs. Featherby in DuckTales. Woo! And, of course, DuckTales, the movie. Mm -hmm. Kenneth Mars was the voice of King Colbert, and in Young Frankenstein, he was Inspector Kemp. Hmm. You've still not seen Young Frankenstein, have you? No, I have not. I can tell by the look since you didn't know who I was referring no, to. No, I haven't. Well, I'll need to make you watch that movie one day. I I, I have it on the list. All righty. Uh, Gary Imhoff was the voice of Prince Cornelius. And in Spider-Man, the animated series, he played Harry Osborn, huh. a.k.a. Green Goblin. The second Green Goblin. second Green Goblin, yes. Green Goblin 2. Electric Boogaloo. Anyway... <laughs> Joe Lynch was the voice of Grundle, a.k.a. the the frog who wanted to hit on Thumbelina. Oh, Mary Thumbelina. Mary Thumbelina. Yes. I marry uh, Thumbelina. He, he did not have much that I think the, me and you would recognize. As yeah. in, he had nothing I think me and you or any other people who normally listen to our show would recognize unless you're British and are aware of a uh, soap opera over there called Coronation Street, and he played someone named Ron Mather. Oh, okay. Charo was the voice of Mrs. Toad. She was a famous guitarist and singer. Mm. And on The Love Boat, she played a character uh, a a few couple times, it looked like, named April Lopez. Huh. Danny Mann was the voice of Mozzo, one of the other frogs. Hmm. And he is Percy in Pocahontas. Oh, okay. I haven't seen Pocahontas in Barbara. Lauren Lester was Gringo, the third of the Frog Brothers. Ah, and he was Robin in Batman the Animated Series. Holy smokes, Batman! Yeah, that was one I wasn't expecting. <laughs> of course, Gilbert Gottfried uh, <laughs> was uh, Mr. Beetle, and uh, he played Iago in Aladdin. No, you think? <laughs> Not to mention a certain insurance duck on uh, those uh, Affleck commercials. <laughs> <laughs> Carol Channing was the voice of Mrs. Fieldmouse. And along with being a Broadway actress, she played Aunt Sylvia on The Love Boat. Oh. I'm detecting a pattern. Yeah, I hear one too. And John Hurt was the voice of Mr. Oh. Mole. He was uh, Kane in Alien. Mm-hmm. You know, the one where oh, the... Oh, uh, yeah. I know, I know who John the, Kane is. John... The face hugger got onto, yep. and then the chest came out of Yes. Him, and then he reprised that role in Space Balls. Balls. <laughs> Yes. But here's a role you may not know he was. He played the doctor in I, Doctor Who. I know he did. He was the war doctor. The war doctor. doctor. <laughs> One of my favorite versions of the doctor. And plus, John Hunt. Three episodes, but still. Wow. Yeah. John Hunt is an amazing actor. You know, we lost a very talented actor when he passed away. But, oh, my gosh. Everything I've ever seen the man in is just, mm-hmm. just genius. Mm-hmm. Okay, we've got three Kingdom Hearts connections. Really? I want you to guess at least two of them. Okay. Guess. Just using... Because well, well, obviously have already seen these characters in one game. Okay, obviously Jody Benson. The game we played. Obviously Jody Benson. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, and... Um, give me a hint. We don't like him in this movie. 
Gilbert Gottfried. Yes! <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried in Kingdom Hearts. You can oh, barely hear his voice when he speaks in the first game. Oh. He does have a bigger role in Kingdom Hearts 2. Oh my god. Because it's based more off of Return of Jafar. And it is definitely Gilbert Gottfried in both versions of that oh, game. Oh my gosh. <laughs> also, uh, Kath- Catherine Soshi, who we brought up last week. Oh, okay. Uh, in this one, she was chicken. One of the chickens in this? I think she was a chicken last week. <laughs> now that I think about it. She, she plays poultry very Hang well. On. Let me double check. I am actually curious. Let me get check last week's notes. Because I am curious now. Uh, nope, she was additional voices. So she might oh, have played okay. a chicken. She might not have. Yeah. We'll never know. No. Even though knowing is half the battle. Moving on. <laughs> She's, of course, Sally, Shock, and Sora's mother. In Kingdom Hearts. Right. Oh. The one line. <laughs> the one line. Sora, your food's getting... Where did you go? <laughs> Sora, dinner's ready. Come on down. <laughs> Sora. <laughs> and you'll never hear from her, her again. again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that is funny. <laughs> that it, it makes sense in that scene. Why we never get to hear that character ever again. Oh my gosh. Or her. His father, which I have no idea if it's alive. I mean, this is a Disney movie. Probably one of the parents is dead. That is true. <laughs> Probably the father. Anyway. That's, a, that's, br- that's end, a flip, but either way. That's the end of the Kingdom Hearts connections. All right. What have we got in info and stuff? Okay. So info and stuff. IMDB has a 6.7 out of 10. You can cur- you can watch it on Disney Plus right now if you're subscribed to Disney Plus, mm-hmm. which I would probably recommend getting because it's Disney Plus. Um, a lot of good stuff on it. Yeah, huh? A lot of good stuff on it. I agree. Though I'll understand if you're boycotting it for numerous reasons. Yeah, I know a lot of people who do. Uh, it was produced. Obviously, this movie was produced by two companies originally. It was originally produced by um, Don Bluth, uh, Don Bluth Studio, which went into bankruptcy during the middle of the production. Yes. And he restarted a new production with Don Bluth, Ireland. Inc. or uh, Incorporated. Which is the m- studio he made Rockadoodle with. Yeah, exactly. But or somehow Don Bluth Sullivan, which is the other one he did, with, he used with uh, uh, All Dogs Go to Heaven and Land Before Time? Yeah, something like that. Did not is, did not get involved in this one. Yeah. Why does the man have three animation studios? That's my well, they Well, each each and every time be like Don Bluth does a project, be he like... He makes a new studio. <laughs> he makes a new studio because the studio goes under. Yes, because... No man, no one will pay this man the money he deserves. <laughs> Sounds like it. All right. So uh, it was distributed by uh, MGM or uh, Metro uh, Goldwyn, Metro Goldwyn Meyer. Am I saying that right? Mayor. Mayor. Uh, originally. And then this is after Samuel Goldwyn Company got bought by them who made the last uh, movie we did, Rockadoodle. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, because original originally it was uh, there again. I'll get into that part of it later. Uh, so it was released on May thirtieth, March thirtieth, nineteen ninety four. It's box office budget. It had estimated budget of twenty eight million dollars. It's it's weekend release of April third, nineteen ninety five, nineteen ninety four had two point three million dollars. Mm-hmm. And its U.S. gross was eleven point three million dollars. Okay. Yeah, this movie, and I think internationally it made twenty two million. So it failed box office wise. Mm-hmm. Complete, and I think it's that's one of the, the weird thing about nearly every Don Bluth movie. Did any of them ever succeed in the box office? I'm not sure. I, I know. But yeah, he's a beloved name. Yeah. And he never made any money in the box office. <laughs> well, uh, I know Land Before Time, it, it made money. Uh, American Tale had to have made money for yeah, him to American make Tale, West. Yeah, American Tale made money. Uh, there again, these are all different studios doing this. Yes, but it's still Don Bluth. Yeah. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird. Just, let's just say that. Why did no? I, I, I suspect many main studios tried to hire him, but he uh, put it aside every time because he did not want to get in the same situation he was in with Disney. True, but still, I wonder why he never got fully attached to one 
uh, studio, even though a lot of his stuff got released by Fox. Yeah. But anyway. All right. So uh, there again, for some reason, I'm making my notes. The the lining, how it was lining up kind of mixed up. So it's world gross was the exact same with 11.3 million, but I read somewhere else. It was 22 million, but neither were. Uh, so home release, uh, war- originally home Warner, home Warner video released Thumbelina on v- home video. Yes. Warner home video released Thumbelina on VHS and laser disc on July 26th. 1994 mm-hmm. in the United States and Canada internationally different um, in different countries throughout the nineties. The film was re-released on VHS in the United Kingdom on March 20th, 1995 Warner home video, Warner home video released it on DVD on March 29th, 1999 Thumbelina was re-released once again on VHS and DVD through 20th century, 20th century Fox home entertainment on February 19th, 2001 and on Blu-ray on March 6th, 2012. This movie was available. This movie was available to view on Disney plus when it was launched on November 12th, 19, 2019, following Disney's acquisition of 20th Century Fox earlier that year. However, it was removed on July 1st, 2022, and it remains available to view in other countries. But currently, right now, it is able to watch. Yeah, you are able to watch on Disney Plus right now. It has been re-added. Uh, that, that date in particular it was on October 22nd, 2021. The film is also available available to view viewed on Disney plus under the star banner name when star, when star was launched on October 22nd, 27, 2021 in Japan. So apparently it's like a, like a sister brand or something on Japan. Uh, it's more than just in Japan, but essentially star is like the, uh, international the, the banner that they put stuff that, well, you know how in America we've got, uh, most of Disney Plus stuff is like P, maybe PG thirteen. Yeah, and in there you've got some stuff that's like you got movies that obviously make sense, but then some stuff they don't put on there because of you know some criteria. Yeah, and then those end up on Hulu. Yeah, well, Hulu is not available in other countries. That's true. So they make so it... they in order so they could still stream the stuff. They have made a kind of a sub brand called Star that goes in the same banner stuff that the other five options go in and you can't get there unless you know, you're got a certain account that can actually, that is an adult account. I got you. Which was weird considering this movie is in, was in that, but yeah, that is odd. I guess cause it's not either anyway. Yeah. Either or anyway, maybe they didn't like the singing so much. They put it on this star well, with Gilbert Gottfried singing. <laughs> makes sense to me. <laughs> All right. That's all I got for an info and stuff. All right. Getting into the summary. A lonely widow, longing for a child of her own, is given a barley seed by a friendly witch. The planted seed grows into a flower, and a tiny girl emerges from inside, no bigger than the old woman's thumb. The old woman names the tiny girl Thumbelina and raises her on as her own. Although Thumbelina loves her mother, she craves companionship from someone her own size. One night, the fairy prince Cornelius stumbles upon Thumbelina after hearing her singing. The two take a ride on Cornelius's bumblebee and fall in love. I'm sure prince, uh, Queen Elsa has a lot to say about that. Mm-hmm. During this ride, prince, Miss, Mrs. Toad and her son Grundle are enchanted by Thumbelina singing. That night, Mrs. Toad kidnap Mrs. Toad kidnaps Thumbelina, desiring her to join their show troop and marry Grundle. Thumbelina is rescued by Jockimo, a swallow. Meanwhile, Cornelius learns of her kidnapping and returns to his kingdom, the Vale of the Fairies, to ask his parents to try holding back the winter as long as they can, but they can only hold it for a day. Grundle learns that Thumbelina escaped and ventures out to find her. While trying to get home, Thumbelina is ambushed by Berkeley Beetle, who promises to show her show her the way home if she sings at the Beetle Ball. She reluctantly complies, but her bug disguise falls off during the concert and she is denounced as ugly as well as being publicly humiliated in front of the audience. Beetle rejects her without Beetle rejects her without helping her. 
She is next found by Giacomo, who promises to find Cornelius. Again. Again. Beetle is confronted by Grundle and suggests that Grundle kidnap Cornelius and use him as bait to lure Thumbelina. Grundle coerces Beetle into partnership by removing his wings. Couldn't have happened to a better bug. <laughs> Upon the arrival of winter, Giacomo injures his wing and loses consciousness from the extreme cold, while Cornelius falls into a pond by wind and is frozen. And that's the end of our movie. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Should have been. <laughs> Beetle finds Cornelius' frozen body and takes him to Grundle. Good thing he didn't let him go. Thumbelina is forced to take refuge in an old shoe where she is discovered by Miss Fieldmouse and granted shelter in her underground house. After relaying Cornelius' fate to her, Mrs. Fieldmouse introduces her to her neighbor, Mr. Mole, who becomes infatuated with her and desires to marry her. Devastated by the apparent loss of Cornelius, Thumbelina gives in to hopelessness and accepts Mr. Mole's proposal. Giacomo revives, and before Thumbelina can get a chance to explain to him what happened to Cornelius, resolves to find him before the wedding. Beetle tells Grundle of Thumbelina's wedding. When she le when they leave Cornelius behind, a trio of friendly insect children find and thaw Cornelius. At the, at the wedding, Thumbelina finds herself unable to marry Mr. Mole after remembering Cornelius' promise to always love her. Grundle and Beetle arrive, and a chase ensues. Cornelius also arrives and engages Grundle in a fight which culminates with the two falling into a chasm. Thumbelina escapes on a pile of Mr. Mole's treasure, causing it to fall at Mr. Mole and the wedding guests. Giacomo finds the Veil of the Fairies, finally, and takes Thumbelina there. She and Cornelius reunite, and she magically grows her own pair of wings upon accepting his proposal, with her mother and the fairy court in attendance. The two marry and depart on Cornelius's bumblebee, much to her, his mother's chagrin. The credits images reveal that Beetle's wings regrew and he resumed his pop career. <laughs> Grundle survived the fall with a broken leg and married a female toad to his mother's delight. And Mr. Mole married Miss Fieldmouse, which is, I was kind of wondering during that song why she didn't marry Mr. Mole. That's what I kept thinking. <laughs> but apparently she did afterwards. But anyway, getting into the trivia for this episode, for this movie, the producers, Jen... The producers generated positive ratings during test screenings by playing the Walt Disney Pictures logo at the beginning, making viewers <laughs> think they were watching a Disney movie. Go Don Bluth. <laughs> Ironically, Disney purchased this film through their acquisition of 20th Century Fox, which replaced, who replaced Warner Brothers as the distributor due to Fox acquiring Don Bluth Ireland Limited. <laughs> the production company. This is the first animated movie, as I said earlier, to win a Razzie Award. It received Worst Original Song for Mary the Mole, sung by Carol Channing. They could have picked a worse song. Let's just say that. Yes, they could have. This is one of two movies based on Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales to feature Jody Benson as the title character. No, nah, do tell. The Little Mermaid. No, nah, of course not. This movie was originally scheduled to be distributed by MGM in the United States and J&M Entertainment overseas. Mm -hmm. But by the time it was completed, both companies dropped the arrangement due to concerns about the bankruptcy of Bluth Studio. Warner Brothers subsequently bought the distribution rights in March of 1993. Mm -hmm. Angelina Ball was the live-action reference model for Thumbelina, as well as Goldie from Rockadoodle, the pre our previous movie. Ah, that makes sense. Don Bluth admitted in a 2010 interview that the script was one of the film's shortcomings. They hired a screenwriter to write a draft that Bluth ended up rejecting. However, due to crunch in the schedule, Bluth had to have a new script done in two weeks. That explains some stuff. Mm -hmm. Gary Imhoff was in his late 30s when he recorded the voice of 16-year-old Prince Cornelius. King Colbert, a.k.a. Ken, uh, played by Kenny Mars, comes to the defense of his son by asking Queen Tabitha if she remembers being 16. This was precisely the problem that Mars's character, King Triton, had in The Little Mermaid, mm. which also starred Jody Benson and was also based on a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. Huh. The connections in a weave. This was originally released with an Animaniac short. What? <laughs> yeah. I'm Mad is the name of it. I saw that. And I was like, huh? The character of Giacomo is named after uh, Casanova. Or his first name is actually Giacomo Casanova. Mm, yeah. Who was well known for his seductive ways and often called the world's greatest lover. Could he come up with another song to sing? <laughs> yes. Jody Benson played Thumbelina and Gilbert Gottfried, who was Mr. Beetle, 
had previously done animated movies, as we said before, Little Mermaid and Aladdin. Nah, you think? <laughs> this was originally intended for a Thanksgiving 1993 release. Mm-hmm. This is Jody Benson's first animated movie not produced by Disney. Hmm. Barley and Poppies are apparently a uh, sign of fertility and birth in some beliefs. Really? Apparently. Huh. Because she was burned from a, a barley seed. Mm. Both this and A Troll in Central Park from 1994 were in production simultaneously at Don Bluth Studios in Ireland. Initially, <laughs> Troll was to be released first, followed by Thumbelina. But it was then decided to release the latter first as it was a it was a pre-sold commodity given its origins as a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. Mm. This became part of Disney canon after Disney bought Fox. This is Gilbert Gottfried's second theatrically released animated film after Aladdin, and Follow Your Heart from a, has a strikingly sim, has a strikingly similar strikingly similar to Meet Me in St. Louis, uh, from the same movie. Mm. The, yep. the song does. Okay. Anyway. Hmm. That brings me to the end of the trivia. Yeah. So, uh, what's your first like? My first like would be like after reading the the uh, synopsis of the book, like just you know the the cliff notes of it, mm-hmm. understanding it. Uh, yeah. Why this... would we have time to read a fairy tale? <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, I I found it was very a faithful adaptation of the book, minus the uh, uh, more the... faithful than. Um... The most recent adaptation of a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. Which one would that be? Frozen, because it's Frozen is not an adaptation. Oh, Fro- Frozen is, is so much is a, a very loose adaptation. Yeah, loose, extremely story. loose. Yeah, this is such. I mean, like it's a faithful, like to the core, like hit on, spot on. Be like they changed a little bit here, definitely with the prince. Um, but other than that, be like it's a great adaptation of the book. Or the 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 fairy tale that Han Christian Anderson, Han Christian Anderson created, and uh, there again, if you've ever read anything Han Christian Anderson, it's always dark, like most fairy tales. Yeah, like most fairy tales. Well, I still suspect that the reason we, the word grim is a dark term for us is mm-hmm. because of the Brothers Grimm. Yeah, exactly. I'm it is convinced. It is. Well, most of Han Christian Anderson's stories fairy tales and shorts are all very dark and most of them do not end on a happy note. Let's say that. Well, kind of. This one kind of does. It kind of does, it but does. it comes out of left field. <laughs> More on that in a minute. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, for the most part, this movie is a faithful adaptation from Han Christian Anderson's fairy tale of the same name. Okay. What is your first like trip? My first like is the animation in this, especially oh, the very beginning oh, yeah. of uh, Giacomo uh, flying through town. Mm-hmm. I thought I the first couple of seconds of this, I was like, oh, wow, that is beautiful for mm-hmm. this time period. Yeah, there's some uh, it's obviously uh, a CG uh, setup for that. But wow, they that, yeah. that actually looks very really good there's i agree with you there's uh everything stays within model throughout the entire um mm-hmm. uh, the thing which a lot of times when you see that that style of shot in animation mm-hmm. and there's always some weird little uh morphing that goes on as you're heading to you know as you're heading yeah. towards it but uh the animation throughout the whole thing uh, i i was was very good i especially like how they handled the fairy wings mm-hmm. both on uh no, mostly on the uh, on the fairy prince Cornelius, mm-hmm. but also the a- appearance of them on Thumbelina at the end. I like how they handled that. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of good little animation things here and there. Uh, it's uh, one of the things that will always amaze me about Don Bluth is how much he is able to of animation he's able to squeeze out of what must be stone mm-hmm. because. The man has no has never had any money to produce this stuff, not not to the quality that we see. Yeah, and yet every single one of these movies is, I, you can never fault the animation for these movies. Mm. I can maybe be a little picky from time to time, right? Of course, but what from what you get, I mean, the, especially considering some other things I've seen, uh, the animation <laughs> is. Very, very well done, and, I, and it was a treat to watch. Okay. 
Uh, what's your second? Like? My second like lead uh, bleeds into yours. The animation in this movie is very well done. Definitely, you're dealing with a small character and a bunch of uh, woodland creatures that talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're dealing with a lot of very good uh, perspectives and forced perspectives of how tall things are. Definitely, when you're dealing with Thumbelina and she's dealing with her mother's cottage, and like all the perspective is very well done. Be like you get you are immersed in this idea that you are a very small person in a very large world. And uh, you have the sympathy towards Thumbelina in that regard. So you have this, the perspective is so large, the, how the backgrounds and everything, like even the point where um, Thumbelina's mother is putting her dress on her, her, her very large bed and her very thumb size or thumb sized dress on that bed, giving that nice, good perspective of how small this character is. And uh, throughout the entire film, perspective is so well done, is very well done. The the rotoscoping they did in this film is very well done, because mm-hmm. uh, you can tell it's rotoscoped. Oh um, yeah, that's just how Don Bluth th- did most of the human animation in these things. Exactly, and they're done very well. Uh, it's like you can definitely tell this was rotoscoped. This was you know filmed, then shot, then uh, laid over, and basically yeah. traced to do rotoscoping. Um, if you didn't know what rotoscoping is, that's what rotoscoping. Uh, it's very hard. It's very hard. It's a lot harder than traditional stuff. You'd think it would be easy. It's not. No, it's not. <laughs> and a lot, a lot of people uh, accuse Disney of doing the exact same thing. No, they don't. <laughs> Their version of... They do did do a lot of live action... References. Uh, references, but mm-hmm. they were references. They looked at them and drew. Look at them and then drew. drew. It was never printed out, put a piece of celluloid over draw and paint that was never how yeah it was. exactly so yeah the what what don bluth was able to do in this film definitely with the the huge shoestring budget he had of 20 22 28 million dollars um you know, he did very well with what he had and i i that's props because the man could like drew said earlier he can he can uh he can milk he can milk gold from stone and just, it's just brilliantly done animation wise. Uh, so that's my second, like what is your third? My second, like you mean? Yeah. Your second, like, so it's been a while since we've kind of brought up a religious Christian thought. Okay. One of these go for it, but I kind of, uh, noted something. Okay. And I, I'm going to say this in the fact that I have no idea if this is in the Hans Christian Andersen tale. Okay. Because I haven't read it. Although I, my my understanding with the prince not showing up until the end of the story in the in the original tale, they may not have been able to do this as well. I don't know. But here's the thing. At the very beginning, of course, she meets the prince, mm-hmm. falls in love with him. Yeah. This is about it takes about half an hour to get to that point. Which was a little annoying on that pacing, but whatever. Mm. They were setting up. They were setting up everything. Yeah. She falls in love with him, and then he goes away. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Now, admittedly, her kidnapping by Charo Frog <laughs> was not her fault. No. In any way, shape, or form. But they get her there, and they start tempting her to don't marry the prince. Join. Uh, do the fame and fortune thing here and yeah. hang out with us. And for a little bit, she's into the idea. Yeah, it's coercion. But then she realizes, oh, I can't do that. But they're, of course, not listening. And they go off. And so it's like, okay. And she's, so she kind of, she, she was tempted mm-hmm. with fame and fortune. Yeah. See where we're going. Second trial she mm-hmm. went through was uh, with Mr. Beetle. Mm, character yeah. design and all that is not with Sandy, but he, uh, for at least the, throughout the beginning of it, was uh, always you know praising her for her beauty and everything until mm, yeah that's the, which honestly more on that when we get to dislikes and yeah. how that was handled but mm-hmm. she she was uh, she had been she was given so much as. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, praise? Praise over how beautiful she was and that she allowed herself to be coerced to go to the Beetle Ball mm-hmm. only for her to get kind of thrown to the side mm-hmm. at later. 
And then when she thinks her prince is dead, because mm-hmm. bear in mind, this has been at least three days by this point yeah, since that, that night, because it had to have been considering he's a fairy sickle. We went from autumn to winter. Still actually has to be a whole season, not just three days. Otherwise yeah. It's a very fast seasonal transition. Oh yeah, it is. But again, it kind of is, but, uh, then she's tempted with, well, if you can't have the prince, mm-hmm. why don't you get the next best thing mm-hmm. and marry the mole? Yeah, he's got wealth. He's got money. Because mm-hmm. the M is for money. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. L-E. <laughs> oh, my I, gosh. And she actually is kind of thinking, like, yeah, this it might be. Mm-hmm. this From a practical point of view, this might be the best thing I can do now. Oh, yeah. Because she has no idea where she how far she is from home. Mm -hmm. We have no idea how far she is from home at this point. Um, She can't make it back now because it's winter. Mm -hmm. So by the time she makes it back home, uh, she's going to be a popsicle or Or a thumbsicle thought to be dead Mm -hmm. because of how long she's been missing. She feels she's got to hang out with Mrs. Field Mouse either way. Uh This, she could at least be comfortable, especially since the love of her life, she believes to be dead. Yeah. But at the last minute, she has, she realizes she can't because she's in love with the prince. Right. And so Giacomo finally does his job and gets her to the the, the Vale of the Fairies. Or does he? Gets her to a weed patch. Yeah, gets her to a weed patch. I was going to say that. Gets her to a weed patch and says, oh, you got to sing to make a half, make, make him show up. Mm-hmm. And she does this. And she's not really into it at first. It's like, I've done all, I, I've. There's no way he's alive. I heard he was frozen. There's no way he's still alive. I don't know why you think me going to the fairies is going to make anything different. What are they going to do? Put yeah. me on trial for the murder of, of the prince? Because I, I don't know. But because she, even though her faith is small that the prince is still alive, she still does do it and the prince shows up. That is true. And then they get married. She married the prince. And conceivably they all lived happily ever after yeah. except for our three villains yeah although they still kind of got their happy endings as well in, in a way yes just not the happy endings they thought they were getting in this movie right and what i'm getting at here yeah you know, it does seem like i'm kind of gone off on a little tangent i don't exactly remember where it says this in the bible i sh- probably should have looked it up but we as christians Specifically, it says the church, but mm. the church in this instance is referring to the Christ, uh, Christians mm. yes. as the bride of Christ. Mm-hmm. And the bride of Christ has, and Christ himself has gone up to heaven, and we have no idea when he returns. Yeah. Much like Thumbelina has no idea when the prince is going to get back, even mm-hmm. if she had stayed in the cottage. Yeah. Through circumstances both in her control and out of her control, she yeah. got into very. Sticky situations yeah. in which the world co- was trying to coerce her to not marry the prince. Huh. Isn't that what we have to face all the that time? That is because so true. While it is weird for two guys to be talking about marrying the prince when we're both straight, <laughs> <laughs> in many ways, Jesus could be considered... The... Well, no, he's the king. I mean, we got it a little bit better than Thumbelina had. Right. But... Uh, <laughs> He is actually the King of Kings, so yes. it's definitely a lot better than what Thumbelina had. But um, we've got something better than whatever money, uh, beauty, or fame mm-hmm. can ever get us. Yeah, we've got you know the King of the Universe coming back for us. Yeah, we don't know when it's going to happen. Yeah, but we must wait patiently and not, not give in to the temptations. That is or so true. We're going to be in deeper doo doo. Agreed. As she nearly got into three times in this film. Agreed. And that's the only, and that's the reason why this movie went for me from being a six to what I'm going to eventually rate it because it wow. went up because I sitting there and all of a sudden that thought, you know, you know, you ever get those thoughts that you know are too smart to be yours? Yeah, kind of like the this Holy Spirit talking those, to you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if this is the Holy Spirit talking to me, but at least it was a a thought that came up from the back of my, it probably was the Holy Spirit, but a thought that reminded me in the back of my head while I was watching, it goes, yeah, this is what you're actually doing. And I went, huh. 
I don't think that Don Bluth was going for this because why would he? <laughs> this is a very worldly secular film and I have yeah. no idea what his faith is, but it's amazing what you can pull when, you know, all truth is God's truth. True. Get right down to it. So yeah, that's, that's what I got from it. And that's my second like. Okay. Uh, mine would be along the same, the same general lines. Cause at first I didn't have a third. I didn't have a third like, but when you said that, it made me think of the idea that Thumbelina does have her own agenda. Be like, she, she has her own agency about things. She wants to get home. She wants to get back to her prince. Uh, and the, the general, um, um, the, the general idea of these stories that they fall in love the, the first night they meet the first, the first glance they see each other they're in love with each other. You know, the idea, the, the general fairy tale idea. So Thumbelina is given is she's kidnapped, kidnapped by the toads and she's coerced into doing these things. And basically it's along the same lines that she has her own agenda, that she has the desire to get back home Mm -hmm. Uh, through all of these like terrible situations she's thrown into that all these people want her, but she still holds her her own agenda. She holds to her own uh, ideas. Do no, I want to get home. It's not, Oh, I, I give in to whatever people are telling me to do. And she continues on her path, trying to get back home, trying to get back to the prince and her, her sustaining hope that the prince will come for her at one point, or she has to get back to the prince. And I, I found that very interesting. Like you said earlier, the, the fact that, uh, she, she is, she is tempted by the world. She is tempted by the temptation to yes. be famous, tempted to have security with Mr. Mole or, uh, Again, fame with the the crickets. Am I saying the crickets? Beetles. 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 Crickets. They're bugs. Um, so the yeah, to the beetles. Bugs, but sure. Yeah, going to the beetles. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, not the beetles. Not those beetles. You know, they broke up years oh, ago. Yeah, if you're gonna have a beetle ball, you really should have a Paul McCartney singing instead of Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, brother. Um. So yeah, it's the the idea that uh, Thumbelina does have her own agency about things, and she has the she has her goal in mind is to marry the prince, and um, the the prince's agenda is always you know trying to find Thumbelina because he's in love with her, and uh, I don't think that's how love really works, but it's how fairy tales work, um, and we as Americans as a culture we have this very weird idea definitely if you're a girl or something like that, or be like the the notion of growing up and you're listening to all of this be like with fairy tales and be like oh you you marry your prince you fall in love with a princess and uh you live happily ever after which is never in true life in life that really isn't the case um life uh people falling in love it can be hard it can be troubling it can have uh, problems, ups and downs, and it's not just be like, oh, oh, I'm in love with you. Let's get married, live happily ever after. Things are never that simple, far as I understand. And um, and it's it's life is challenging. Life is hard, and to to boil it down to this very essence, we want to have this fantasy world of just everything's perfect when I mean, it's not. But the idea that our 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 main pro- protagonist in Thumbelina has an agenda. She has her own agency. She she wants to get back to where she wants. But like her comfort, her security is her mother's home, even though she feels small and there's no one around her except for the prince who is in love with her. So it's this, it's this different idea of a a fairy tale, and I I kind of enjoy that in a way. So yeah, it's my number three. My third like. Uh, my third like is, and I can't remember it now. I had something there for a minute. For the most part of. 
I mean, the character designs in this are good for the most part. The animation, of course, is good. I talked about that. Mm-hmm. The story is good. Honestly, I don't know if I have a third like. Mm. It sounds bad, but honestly, I think I kind of wrapped up my likes in both my first and second. Because... Uh, this well, this is a good movie. Do not get me wrong. It's just there's, I think it's gonna hit on the okay side for me. For being okay. honest, so yeah, uh, let's get into dislikes. Okay, what's your first? Uh, my first dislike is oh my gosh, the songs. I'm oh, we're of the same thought. Oh my gosh, wow, just because at, at first I had this thought and it's like oh it's this and it's like no no no, no. be like that actually makes it a really good part of the story. But the the songs in this movie, oh my gosh, some of them make no sense. Because one, our character singing about this, and da 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 And the next thing they were talking about this was the complete opposite. It's like, what in the world? Like, lyrically, sometimes it makes no sense. Yeah. And it's just like, oh my gosh. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll get into the song that really just irked me the entire time. And literally, I wanted to throw, I wanted to turn it off. To I'll, I'll get to that in my second dislike. But oh my gosh, the songs in this be like, and this was done by Mary Barry Manilow. Barry Manilow. Not Seriously. his best work. No, it's not his best work. Uh, my mom loves Barry Manilow. I'm like, mom, you should listen to this soundtrack. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> And this this was the soundtrack. This is the movie you got the first animated movie Razzie Award. Yeah, the first animated movie to win a Razzie for Award for probably the best, probably the best song in the boot in the entire movie. Yes, in, in a, in a, in I, I think it's just because it's so different from the others that it was the one that stuck out, and it's not the worst song. No, it's not. Oh my gosh! I'm gonna jump in on this because the songs are one it. of my dislikes also. But the song I'm going to at least talk about, I mean, I'll, I'll, we'll go over a couple. Uh, first of all, Jockimo's song can just stuff it. I hate it. Oh, oh, uh, anytime, oh, my gosh. Anytime Jockimo's on screen, I was like, I hate you. Yeah. But more like, on that later. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but his song at the beginning is garbage. The I have to wonder what Barry Manlow was thinking with Thumbelina. It's like, why are you singing... Why are the animals all going? Sounds, the, none of the animals are in key. <laughs> they're not even singing in harmony. And I know it's because they're animals and they're trying to have animal like sounds. Yeah. But at the same time, I'm going, if you scream Thumbelina's name one more time, <laughs> I will fast forward. I don't care what if the animation here is good or not. Uh-huh. You people, you stupid geese are annoying me every time you <laughs> say Thumbelina's name. Oh my g- in this uh, song. Yeah, it's chickens, to, chickens. The They're chicken. chicken. They're chickens. They're chickens which are wearing wigs for some reason. I yeah. guess cuz it's France, but Yeah. Honestly, this does not play into the uh the clothes thing that much for it to really matter to me that Mhm. They're wearing the wigs because honestly, <laughs> if I was a human living in that world, I'd be going, "Why are the chickens wearing wigs?" <laughs> anyway, oh my gosh! All and these... also, the animals have no reason to be there for the most of the movie. They're just the chorus for this opening song, and they have to keep showing up as anytime they go back to the farm. Uh, you've got uh, Charo. I, for one thing, Charo is a very famous singer. She sings very good. She does. She sings very good in this film. Yes, but her song is garbage. Yeah, because it's like, and and they'll be singing that one thing, like she she's singing about. Oh, you should be fame and you, you shouldn't marry. You should be should be going over the fame and the fortune. You'll be big. Of course, I think they make it sound like she's going to be big physically, not yeah. big in, you know, thing. And at the same time, it's like, why would the humans watch frog shows? Yeah. That makes no sense. But and, and, and why would frogs be falling in love with tiny humans? Yeah. Also makes no sense. But you know, fairy tale, whatever. And our and I heard frog legs are very good in France. Yeah, this is why they're <laughs> Spanish frogs. All the French ones are dead. 
to quote Kermit to the frog, I see hundreds of little frogs on crutches. <laughs> anyway, uh, more on. I, I'm not. I'm gonna skip a song because I'm going to come back to that. <laughs> but uh, the mother's song halfway through, where she's worried about her daughter, mm. and then we never see the mother again until the very end. Yeah, that's annoying. Um, Mary the Mole is actually a good song. It is. It's not. It ain't great. got the Razzie. It's not great. Yeah. It's, I really. I think. The, I think the the Razzie must have been recorded wrong. It should be the worst original song for every song in this movie, but Mary the Mole. <laughs> and then the end, the song at the finale, which I think is just a reprise of. Uh, one of the other ones, I can't think right now because at that point my brain was just like, yeah, ee- yeah, it, it, it's that called, was annoying too. <laughs> it's called uh, "Let Me Be Your Wings and Follow Your Heart." Yes. it's a mash of both those songs. First off, you shouldn't follow your heart. Your heart is a den of idol idolatry, but. Uh, <laughs> More religion. Yeah, more, <laughs> more religion than we're talking. Yeah, exactly. More quoting the Bible without remembering where the address is. <laughs> but. <laughs> um, I lost my spot. The, the music in this is like, it's not Barry Manlow's best work. I have heard some of Barry Manlow's song. My mom loves Barry Manlow too. I've heard much better from him. And this is not one of those times. Is this, this is not that good a film, I, that good of songs. Indeed. So I, I kind of figure that Barry Manlow did this like between stuff and just like slapped something out on a first try. Wanted to make a second pass, but Don Bluth couldn't pay him anymore. And they just put out whatever they made. That's really what it feels like. Mm. But yeah, that's my second. Oh my. My first dislike. What's Ugh. your second dislike? My Oh my gosh. Here comes a rant. Here comes a rant. Oh my gosh. What so, is anything like my rant that's coming up? Giacomo. Close. This Close. Is Giacomo's my oh, third dislike. Oh my gosh. Giacomo. Oh my gosh. Be like, okay, he's our narrator in this film. Okay. As stated last time, narration is not a bad use. No, it's if not it's a bad done use. Correctly, and if it's planned. If he ki- if be like, okay, when he first sings, follow your heart, which is like the stupidest thing in the planet. <laughs> yes. Like why, why on earth be like, I understand. Follow your heart, follow your feelings. I okay. Understand. You're fo- your I understand. The se- Sorry. I yes. am talking over you. You're you good. Asked me not to, but I, you're I good. Feel like I need to say something. I understand what he's saying. Yeah. I understand exactly what he's saying. He is not saying be stupid about it. He is yeah. saying be intelligent, but you still try to follow your dreams, mm-hmm. but he's not saying follow your dreams. He said, follow, follow your, your heart. heart. And the heart will lead you astray yes. very easily. Yes, agreed. Yes, it's just the idea that be like, oh, follow my heart, follow my feelings. And it's I'd like, rather follow my nose to a, <laughs> to a bowl of Fruit Loops. <laughs> agreed. So it's just the, the idea of the song, and I'm trying to find the lyrics of the song because it's so stupid. <laughs> but either way, Giacomo is he's the most worthless character in the planet to, to me. It was the fact that this stupid, stupid, but either I get so frustrated talking about this character because he shows up out of nowhere and he's like, Oh, be like someone is in trouble. And it sings, follow your heart. Like five times throughout the song, throughout the entire movie. By the end of the movie, he's singing it again at the end of the movie during the credits. I wanted to tear my eyes out. <laughs> okay. I brought the lyrics up. Okay. You're sure to do impossible things if you follow your heart. Ugh. Your dreams will fly on magical wings when you follow your heart. heart. If you have to journey far, here's a little trick. You don't need a guiding star. Trust your ticker. Get there quicker. Ugh. No. No, absolutely not. You're sure to do impossible things if you follow your heart. Things you never thought you would ever do. Yeah. Not what he's trying to get at, but... No, he's not. <laughs> So here, here's the thing. It's just like, oh my gosh. And it's like, like whenever like Thumbelina would say anything impossible, like, no, don't say that. He's going he's gonna to say it again. <laughs> and yes. so it's like, that's how he leaves every scene. It's like, 
Follow your hearts. Marry the prince. I'm thinking, shut the pikey plank up. <laughs> shut up, you stupid bird. Go find a worm or something. But, <laughs> oh my gosh. The, the, the fact that it'd be like, oh, Giacomo, all he does, be like, he... Like first he says like oh I'm gonna go find the prince and he goes on finds tries to find the prince he does he nothing never, the, he never the, finds him this stupid bird does not know where he's going no he doesn't that's the problem that's actually proof that the song is trash mm-hmm. because he's following his heart to find the prince and guess what happens mm-hmm. he never finds him mm-hmm. he finally finds where to go when he asks somebody hey where is the the veil of the fairies and he says well my Friend of a 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 friend says it's over here in this weed patch. Oh, okay. So here, here's here's a lyric that uses his head, and that's where it made sense. Okay. So the entire premise of the song is to follow your heart. Okay. So here's the point that got me just drove me nuts. Here's here's the line: North or south, east or west, where to point your shoes. Which direction is best if you if you're choose if you're choosing is confusing, maybe it's your map, it's your using. You're not you're you don't need a chart to guide you. Close your eyes and op- look inside. No. No. The the fact be like, okay, you are leading by your heart. You are leading by your heart, and somehow you get messed up and somehow, oh, it really wasn't it really wasn't me. It was just it was I was I was singing the wrong song. I was listening to the other side of my heart. Let me listen to this other side of the heart. It's stupid beyond belief. Why does this remind me of Kingdom Hearts? <laughs> it's a memory from the other side of your heart. What the crap is that? That's- mean? Sorry. But, but- we, didn't, we didn't even get to that part for you to have to figure out what the crap they're talking about. <laughs> no. But- but it's this idea of be like, if, if you get confused a long way, you've been listening to the wrong thing. What? You know, <laughs> but either or. You know, you know what happens when you close your eyes and follow your heart to that beautiful smelling bakery that sm- you can smell off in the next town over, right? You don't notice yourself falling off the cliff <laughs> that's between you and town. That's what happens. <laughs> and also, there was an illustration I used years ago when I worked in youth. Uh, there was the fact to be like this bird who is like flying, flying along, not paying attention to anything. Oh, I'm following my heart. And everyone's telling me like, no, get away, get away. There's this big jumbo jet coming. It's like, no, I'm following my heart, following my, following my heart. And, uh, it was, and then suddenly Sully has to land the plane in the middle of the Hudson. <laughs> Basically. Cause he gets <laughs> screamed. <laughs> There was a direction you weren't expecting. No, no, it was close. To, to become bird food in Cap- the, the propellers. Sully, Captain Sully <laughs> had to land the plane because a bird hit the engine. Yeah. And that bird was following his heart <laughs> right to his death. <laughs> Thanks, Giacomo. Oh. <laughs> you doomed us all. But, uh, oh my gosh, Giacomo is probably the most useless character in this entire film because all you know when we watched tom and jerry i stated how much i hated that bird that was at the beginning of that film oh yeah i thought there was never another bird character i would ever hate more jockey you proved me wrong (laughs) you are the most hated bird character of me you you are the weakest bird you are the weakest thing goodbye (laughs) but it's like he be like he 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 gets a thorn in his he gets a thorn in his his wing, and he finally finds Thumbelina again when she's freezing her tail end off while he's thought dead. Yeah, he's thought dead. He's thought dead. Be like he's like he like he if froze to death. Don't get my hopes up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's frozen. Good. Oh, good job. No, he thaws out for some reason. Thanks, Queen Elsa. Yeah. Appreciate he, this one. <laughs> yeah. But oh my oh my gosh. Be like he he fly, he flies off. He leaves Thumbelina by herself on this old shoe. Be like, oh, I gotta find the prince. What? Be like, you're leaving the main character by herself. No, no, no. She's freezing her tail end off. She didn't leave her in the shoe. He left her in Mister Mole's. Uh, because he left from Mister because she found him in Mister Mole's uh, uh, storeroom or something. Because he had found. He had found it and declared the dead corpse. The dead bird corpse is his. Yeah. Why? 
I don't, I don't know. know. But the bird was still alive and he escaped. And instead of putting her on his back and flying mm. her away. That is true. That is true. From the wedding she's trying not to do, but feels yeah. like she must do because she has no way of knowing. He disappears because like he won't slow down for Fox <laughs> to let the Molina talk. <laughs> The only good thing, only good piece of advice he had in this, yeah, was when he found her after the bug ball, mm-hmm. and she said, and, and she's going, and, and she's crying. She says, oh "Dear, why are you crying?" Mm-hmm. Says, "Mr. Beetle said I was ugly." It's like, do you do you care what Mr. Beetle thinks? He says, well, "No." That was the only good part of it. He says. And what did the prince think? He says, I'm beautiful. Well, then why don't you only care about what the prince thinks? And it's like, A, that's not really good ways of looking at your self-esteem in the first place. That's true. Even though you should value yourself based more on... If you're still following the the thing I was talking about in my likes, yeah. you know, valuing yourself on what Jesus sees you is mm. better than what anyone on earth sees you. Exactly. There's that, that that's, bit. that's good advice. But that's not the point I'm getting at. Yeah. You, you really should be looking at yourself better than what others think of you as how you think of yourself. Mm. Besides the point, that's the only part he does good in the entire film. That is so true. That is so true. But it's just... Uh, and, and then I'm going to let you finish your point, but thank I'm coming you. back to the bug ball here in a minute. Uh, okay. So in, in conclusion that Giacomo is like, Oh, I, I, I found the fairy place. And he leads her to this briar patch. <laughs> it's like, Oh, you have to sing in order to, and it's like, it's like the girl is depressed. What are you thinking? And somehow that makes everything better. It was either that or Br'er rabbit would find out who's trying to wake him up from a long winter's nap. <laughs> I wish I'm a Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> we will watch that movie at some point. Believe it. <laughs> Believe it. We will. If for no other reason than the historical, for historical reasons. Exactly. But anyway, uh, my second dislike. Yes. Gilbert Gottfried should only have ever played Iago in an animated <laughs> oh my thing. gosh. For one thing, A, his character is, like, worthless throughout most of this film. Mm-hmm. Especially when he's introduced. Yes. And the fact that you post... you, you The guy is supposed to be... Uh, what, what did I say earlier? Um, I, I want to say Rico Suave. Casanova. Casanova. The guy is supposed to be the Casanova of Beatles. Mm-hmm. And you give him a voice like this? <laughs> that makes no sense. Especially when... At least somebody who has to sound like Gilbert Gottfried has to sing here in a couple minutes and still sound like him so you know it's the same character. Uh, You're Beautiful, which is the name of that song. Oh, my gosh. Is the hot piece of garbage (laughs) that should never have been allowed allowed out of Barry Manilow's studio you want to talk about the movie, the, the song that should have won the award for this movie? It's that one. <laughs> and the thing is, it's another one of those where they go off in one direction for the first verse, and then they make a 180 for the second verse. And it makes no sense in this one because she they dressed her up yeah. for this one. Because when he found her, she wasn't wearing that big dress or, and having the fake wings and the fake feelers. Yeah. She was just wearing the same dress she wears she wears throughout the rest of the movie. Yeah. And they dress her up in this for the Beetle Ball. And then they get surprised when they, you know, spin around so fast that her her attire I'm just going falls to say her carapace <laughs> <laughs> disappears. And they go, Oh, look at her. She doesn't even have feelers. She doesn't have a shell. She doesn't even have wings. Oh, I hope she is just ugly. I hope it's not catching. It's like, why did you bring her here? Mm. You knew what she looked like. You hit on her. And I have no idea why if you're going to immediately say she's ugly. (laughs) Were you looking for... It'd be one thing. I I would hate... This would make the character heinous. Yeah. But she's already kind of heinous. But it would make the character... Heinous, if at the very least, 
we thought he did this to make himself look better in front of the other Beatles. Yeah. But that's never stated. That's no. not even implied. Because the be- other Beatles are only in this musical number. Yeah. And they're not in the rest of the film when Gilbert Gottfried is speaking normally. Except for his little backup dancers help him get the prince out of the... Uh, the, 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 the ice. Prince out of the ice. Oh my gosh. But... Whose bright idea was this? This the character existing makes sense. The character, you know, going with a more raspy, rough voice for a insect, I understand. That actually does make some sense. Letting him sing? Not so much. Not so much. My ears bled. I'm half convinced. <laughs> That's how horrible this sounded. <sighs> And why, and the thing is, do you remember why, what, what he said, why, why he went, why, why he wanted her to come to the, to the beetle ball? It wasn't so she could stand there and look pretty and kind of dance. Yeah. It was so she could sing. And what did she not do in this song? Sing. She didn't sing a word. She literally all, just danced. <laughs> all we, the only even words that she even spoke were... Wing it? I don't have wings. And Mm. I'm ugly? Yeah, pretty much. And it's like, y'all should have looked at this a little bit better. This could have used a little more spit and polish. (laughs) Maybe a little bit. No sense. No, it doesn't. So ever. It's a beautiful scene for its animation. Uh The dancing is good. Even the designs on the Beatles, which is what I assume they are because they look like monstrosities. <laughs> but the entire point, it, doesn't, it has no point other than make her feel bad for five seconds so she'll fall in love with the prince. It's again. She, the prince thinks she's beautiful even though the insects she didn't care about thought she was ugly. Glee. Yeah. What's your third dislike? Oh, okay. All right. So mine is the conclusion to our happily ever after movie. So there again, this is based off a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale story. And I'm thinking because the way this movie turns around at the end, be like, it's literally, Oh, we have to, we have to rush to get this movie finished. I don't know if it was production. I don't know if it was budget or whatever, but it felt like the end of this movie was very rushed. So there again, the, the idea that I our think of a fourth villain, apparently. <laughs> so uh, Prince Cornelius gets his fairy, butt frozen in ice for an entire season. And magically he comes back to life. There again, in this is fairness, not in the original story. In all fairness, it wasn't the whole season. It was maybe a day, maybe a day. Maybe part of a season. Maybe. A day is part of a season, yes. Yes. It's really not shown how yeah, but it, this movie takes place because it looks like maybe it took place over the course of two days if you're going off of just the, the sequence of events. But yet we go from fall to dead of winter. Yeah. So. Like that. So yeah. You're, I have you're, no you're, idea. You're talking to span like a season and a half. Of what's going what's going on during the course this of this movie should have started in October and ended in February. Yes, the way it's presented, but yeah, it also makes it look like it's over the course of two days. Yeah, when so, it's over the course of several months, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. We don't know. We don't Continue. know. Continue. Yeah, that's from my We're perspective. Getting off on a tangent. Yes, we are. Don't we always when, get when on tangents? <laughs> exactly. So, just like the the fact that our prince has become a a fairy pop. <laughs> and I, exception of one little finger <laughs> except for one little finger like he's frozen solid like he fall, he falls in the water because his bug gets hit by ice and he freezes the death and somehow magically by the power of love he's able to re- come back from the dead <laughs> and just the the idea that oh because oh she she gains her wings because she she falls in love with the prince. I understand that from a, like, if you're doing a fairy tale story. And symbolicness. It's, and, and symbolism. She, 
And the question is, was she a fairy or just a tiny human? We don't we'll never know. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we're not really told in this. Be like, I don't know if Hans Christian Anderson's story elaborates more on this or not, but it's like, ugh, just the, the ending of this movie feels so rushed. There, there's just more be like, they, they could have, if they would have fleshed out a little bit more of this story and not just be like, Oh, be like uh Giacomo, the most worthless bird ever brings her to a briar patch. There's nobody there except briars. Um, and it's like, Oh, you need to sing in order to, and somehow she has the, the ability to bring back summer. Um, I don't think that's what's happening. I don't know, but it's, it seems like that's what's going on. There again, like it seems the the end of this movie was extremely rushed for some reason, and they had to get to the ending very quickly, and it's just rushed beyond belief, and it's just like, <sighs> this is the ending we're getting. And then the kicker that drove me nuts, <laughs> that drove me absolutely nuts. It's like Giacomo sings again. It's like, shut up, bird. Just shut up. And then it, <laughs> it goes black, and then we get... Follow your heart sung again by Jacobo. I'm like, I'm going to, by the end of the movie, I was so frustrated. It's something you funny. <laughs> so I yes, feel like you're not rating this movie very high. <laughs> <laughs> stupid Jacobo. Speaking of stupid Giacomo, my third dislike is Giacomo, the most worthless bird <laughs> on Intel and movie history. First off, Bird gives bad advice. We already covered this. <laughs> yes, we have. Secondly, Bird doesn't listen to humans or anybody. <laughs> Fairy-like creatures. That is true. We don't know what Thumbelina actually is. Um, <laughs> he's hyped up on Birdseed, apparently. <laughs> yes. He's so dedicated to fulfilling his promise and helping Thumbelina find the prince. Mm -hmm. Yet he never gets there. It's like, how big is this forest mm -hmm. that you can't find? I, I get it. You're looking for one little person in a giant haystack, and essentially mm -hmm. spread out over the course of what I'm assuming is at least some one mile square area of France. Probably not the easiest thing to do. But you're telling me, Giacomo, <laughs> you've never seen the fairies? It makes sense the humans wouldn't see the fairies because, you know... Humans don't normally see fairies, but you're a talking animal, much like the beetles and the frogs and moles and field mouses and all the other talking animals, including the farm animals in this. And you're telling me you never saw the fairies? You don't know where they are? What's up with that? Mm. Also, B, the, bu the bumblebee that Cornelius rides, never talks. No, just buzzes. He just buzzes, despite the fact... He should be just as intelligent as the Beatles. Yeah. Kind of. Anyway, weird tangent. Giacomo can't figure out anything in this movie. He can't. He's an idiot. He's a bird brain. Yes. <laughs> His, maybe that was the point. Maybe that was the joke. I know they can't technically have them reunite too early that will end the movie too early right um, you gotta pad your runtime you well not not just pad your runtime from a story writing point of view they you know you can't really have thumbelina that is true and cornelius meet back again until the end of the film that is true the it, it would be it's just like when we did american tale and we got we saw all those times where five and his family barely missed each other we don't get that here. We no. should have. Yeah, I would have been better. I would in have, in my opinion, if we Agreed. somehow they just somehow kept barely missing each other. But that's not what we get here. Also, the jitterbugs. I hated them too, but they were worthless. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because and they and they are Giacomo's friends. That's not a surprise. They're all worthless, <laughs> worthless characters because they don't do anything other than oh. We're gonna heat we're gonna somehow melt this entire block of ice that the prince is frozen in in five minutes. <laughs> First off, that is not thin ice. That, that is fairly thick ice. That's a block that of is, ice. That is not an ice cube. That is the same type of ice that they 
pulled out of the river at the beginning of Frozen. Mm-hmm. That is how thick this ice is that he, this fairy is frozen into, except for his one little finger sticking up out of the <laughs> hole. Because that made a lot of sense. Yeah. I still don't get and why he twitched they did it. that. Really? Yeah, it's like, oh, look, he's still alive. How? How? Is, are you telling me the fairy prince was cryogenically frozen in the block of ice? Or he's immortal. Well, I mean, he did freeze fast enough. That was fast freezing ice. That was. Because he's just swimming along, trying to get out. He's so close, and all of a sudden, shoo, flash frozen. <laughs> it's like, I don't think it works that way. Wait. It's in nature. In this situ- in France, it don't work that way naturally. Right. There's more to it than that. I don't know how you froze that quick. I don't care how much. I mean, obviously, this was a fast winter. <laughs> Apparently, it it's like El- Elsa got really mad. <laughs> yeah, she that that year she couldn't let it go. Go, period. Anyway. Arendelle, we feel sorry for you. <laughs> yes, but Giacomo is dumb. He's amen. And even as a narrator character, which grant his narration in this is serviceable. Yeah, it's a rule, serviceable. But even then, he's stupid. It's like. Oh, the greatest love story of my uh, love story that I ever heard is in this little bitty book that's right over here in the corner. You can read Giacomo. This is too. You could remove a stupid thorn from your <laughs> wing, and you can somehow turn the pages in this tiny, tiny mm. book. Exactly. And how can you see us? Should I be worried? <laughs> I hear that birds aren't real, according to some controversial <laughs> some, some uh, sites on the internet that I don't pay, normally pay attention to. Thanks, Dr. Mike. <laughs> I, I heard that long before Dr. Mike said anything. <laughs> me, I'm not me. I've heard that before. Uh, yeah. The beards aren't real, apparently. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the earth is flat, which, considering it's not very carbonated, I would agree. Uh, <laughs> you have heard this. Yes, I've heard this. this. Okay. For those who hadn't, you know, the earth its surface is 70, covered with 70% of water, and most of it is very not, is not carbonated. So, yeah, the earth is flat. Much like this Coke, if I don't finish it. Uh, anyway, Giacomo is worthless. End of discussion. End of my third dislike. I think that's the end of both our dislikes. Yes, it is. We need to rate this thing. All right. Blow me away. No, you. You want me first? Yeah, go ahead. This is going to be interesting. I have a feeling we're both not rating this very high. Okay, go for it. Six. Six, okay. It's not a bad movie. It's an okay movie. It's... Meh, and I was kind of g- going it. Okay, when I, last week when I did looked for the trivia and I saw this won a Razzie award, it mm-hmm. didn't matter what it was for. I thought, oh wow, we got a bad one on our hands. So I went into this with low expectations, mm-hmm. and while I will say it exceeded my expectations, it wouldn't take much. <laughs> <laughs> this is okay. This is not horrible. This is not great. <laughs> this is a six, which is a little better than halfway. Six. What are you rating it? I'm giving it a five. Ooh, wow. <laughs> I have a feeling you were going to rate it lower than me no matter no, what I said. I, 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 I originally wanted to go lower, but there's there's a lot of... There's some good points to this movie. It has some good animation. It has the fact be like our heroine, our our pro, our our main protagonist has an agenda. And she doesn't flow and give in to the temptation of the world. I, I do like that. Um, there's some beautiful animation, like I said before. But just overall, oh my gosh, the songs are at me nuts. Giacomo was the biggest worthless character in this movie. <laughs> Either or, <laughs> trying not to go into another rant over Giacomo. Yes, uh, I, I appreciate th- th- that. There, there were parts of this movie I absolutely just could drove me nuts beyond belief. That's why I said I need a palate cleanser because this movie drove me nuts on so many levels. Well, um, go continue. But yeah, I'm giving it a five. It, it has, be like, has some good parts, and the rest of it can just I don't know go down the river. Funny you should mention going down the river. Do you know what our next movie is? Uh, a movie about yes. Flood? Yeah, weathering with, you, we- weathering, weathering with you. Weathering with you. My trivia question for Weathering with You yep. is, what band wrote the music for this? Mm. 
It's not the same band that... It is the same band that did um, Your Name. Oh, that's right. I was thinking of another band. I was like, wait, that's the different... Never mind. Either or. Yeah, but it's the same band that did Your that Name. That is true. That but is so true. Anyway, what is the name of the... I think it's a band or music group or maybe it's the name of the singer. I don't know. He's Japanese. But yeah, name the guy, the the, the people who made the music for this because they will see if and we'll see if they did a better job than Barry Manilow did with this one. Mm. So yeah, that's what we're gonna do next week. You have anything to add before we uh, finish this thing? Nope. I'm looking for. I'm looking forward to a much better film. Indeed, because we did definitely enjoy this when we watched the re- watched it for a reaction back. Yes, we did. In. The January of 2020. Yes. Pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. Pre-COVID. It's been a long, long two years. years. Mm-hmm. It's been a long winter. 10 years? 15 years? How long has it been? I know technically it says two years on the on the calendar, but it really feels longer than that. It does. <laughs> so, yeah, we're going to be doing Weathering with you next week. We This is a movie I think we're both going to enjoy and definitely will be a much better palate cleanser in than, uh, fairy wings deed in the name of that movie as you watched <laughs> oh yeah prop secret Most of the wings secret That's of the wings. wings yeah anyway so join us next week for that in the meantime this has been drew this is jacob and we'll catch you in the next frame you can follow jacob on his facebook at jacob b heron his facebook page jacob's daily art corner where he tries to draw each and every day his Instagram at Jacob B. Heron, his Twitter at Jacob Heron, and his letterbox at Jacob Heron. You can find Drew on Facebook at Drew Dodgen, his Facebook page Drew's photo bin to see his photography, his letterbox page at G. George 759, his Twitter at G. George 759, and Instagram at Drew Dodgen. You can like us on Facebook at The Cellcast Podcast, on Twitch at The Cellcast Gaming, on YouTube at Cellcast, on Twitter at Cast underscore Cell. The Cellcast can be found at Apple Podcasts, Google Play Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or anywhere else fine podcasts are downloaded from. Please rate and review us where you found us, and also on Podchaser. Email us at thecellcastpodcast at gmail.com. The Cellcast is a proud member of both the Pop Americana and Culture Box Media Networks. For more information, please see the link in the description. Our theme song is Drop and Roll by Silent Partner. And remember, that's Cell with a single L.